Hello, my name is Adrian Natali, and I am here with Alora Kuhn and Mallory Cox, and we are graduate students at Yale University in the Department of Anthropology. And what we're sharing with you today is a video compilation of a research project that we designed for our experimental archaeology class under Dr. Ellery Fromm and Dr. Roderick McIntosh. So we've designed this project as part of a larger um, project that's underway here in the archaeology department. Um, the project itself, itself aims to, to develop and refine uh, techniques for identifying malaria in ancient skeletal remains. And the way we're going to go about doing that is by targeting a biomarker for malaria that's referred to as hemozoan. So hemozoan is an insoluble crystalline pigment. Uh, because it has a central iron atom, it is highly magnetic. Uh, but good news for bioarchaeologists, hemozoan apparently preserves in skeletons of individuals infected with malaria. And so we're on the hunt. What we wanted to know is to what degree, if at all, bone absorbs the magnetic content of the soil in which it is deposited. So we set out to test the taphonomic processes or leaching properties of bone in magnetic soil conditions. Because if soil contaminants are leaching into the bone, this could indicate potentially misleading readings of bone samples. Our first step was acquiring pig bones because pig bones are a great proxy for human bones. Here you can see the pig bones boiling, which we did in order to remove the soft tissue so that the bone would be directly exposed to the soil, as you will see later in the video. And here are our bones. They're very smelly and uh, we're about to shave some of the bone off in order to run it through PXRF and AGM before putting the bones in the soil. Here we have Mallory scraping away along the insides from the bones and then putting the sample into an Eppendorf tube for us to analyze on the PXRF. Smells like death. <laughs> Before burying our bones, we needed to first run preliminary tests to establish a baseline for interpreting our final results. Using PXRF, we will measure the elemental composition. Okay, so our lid is on our PXRF. Our sample is inside and I can see it. So, and I've named it, so I'm gonna press play. And there it is in action. You can see all of the elemental parts per million popping up on the screen there. <laughs> Go. The elevator ding means it's working. All right, now that we've run all of our samples on the portable x-ray fluorescence gun, uh, we have elemental compositions for all of them, and it's time to go prepare some samples for the magnetometer. Okay, Alora, uh, what are you doing right now? Right now, Adrian, I am preparing each sample for EGM analysis. And what that means is that I need to put each little sample piece in this little package in order for us to actually run the analysis. And so right now I'm weighing out part of the outside of sample six. Our goal is the overall weight of the sample, including the tape, uh, can be no more than 50 milligrams in order to not weigh down the probe for the magnetometer. So we're going to start here with this size piece of tape at our smallest of samples, which is about 20 milligrams. And hopefully we can keep the total weight under 50 milligrams. Then we can know that 20 milligrams is a good size standard. We'll do all our samples at that weight. All right, Alora, so you've measured out your sample. So now what are you doing? I have. So now that we've gotten about the size that we want, you're going to actually create the little packet it's going to go into. So how we do this is touching this tape as little as possible. You're going to take some of the sample mm -hmm. and put it on one end and we're going to try to stack each piece on top of one another because eventually we're going to be folding this over to actually create the packet. Okay. And it's looking good. Voila. And we're going to trim that up a bit. Okay. So it creates as uh, the least amount of um, 
there's the least amount of interference as possible, and then we're gonna run it. Great. Thanks, Alora. Right now, the sample is being transferred. Alora has just nicely prepared it so that it is ready to go into the alternating gradient magnetometer. And now Mallory is going to put it in the alternating gradient magnetometer. So Mallory, step us through your process here. So what we have here is a probe set up um, to hold the samples in the magnetometer. Um, in order to mount these little packets that we've made that contain the actual sample. Okay, so first we put a little bit of uh, grease onto the probe just to hold the packet in place, um, a very little amount. Uh, the instrument itself does not recognize the grease, so it doesn't interfere with any of our measurements. And we carefully place uh, the packets that Elora has been preparing onto the probe. Um, Taking the probe from here to the instrument itself. First, we insert it into a little, insert the prongs here. And then we drop down the spring so that it can now vibrate uh, according to the magnetic field that we apply. And we're going to lower it down in between the two magnets. And we're ready to take a measurement. The next step is to prepare the soil to bury the bones. So right now we're measuring out um, portions of hematite. This is pure hematite and we've decided to make, um, make our samples contain either 5%, 3% or 1% hematite. So in order to match the 1000 grams that we have in the samples, we have so right here we have 50 grams or 5% of hematite added to the soil mixture. What I've done is I've just dumped the hematite in and I'm mixing it up right now. So try to create a good dispersion of hematite into our soil so that we have a more or less homogenous I like <laughs> your dance. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's going to make the middle. <laughs> it's going to make the cut. It is. We made two boxes for each level of hematite, one of which was dry and the other with 48 ounces of water added to it. Okay, so we are at the two week mark and we have noticed that with our samples that did not have any water content, mold has started to grow. At the four week mark, with mold now overflowing from our boxes, we took our final samples. This is box five. Check out those bubbles. Oh. <laughs> it smells horrendous. <laughs> it's going in. Oh. <laughs> is the bone uh, soft? No, it's not soft. No, it's not spongy at all, actually. It's, it's very firm. See, there's still quite a bit in there, mm. which we'll have to scoop out. Yep, we will. Soil. <clears throat> and some mold. There's, there'll be a lot of mold in there. All right. Oh! <laughs> Get it out of the nooks and crannies as best you can. I think that's probably, like, yeah, that's that's probably as good as it's going to go. All right. Okay. They've all been removed from their respective boxes. Now it's time to all been thoroughly, dig in. Thoroughly horrified. Okay. All right. So right now I've just, or we have just taken the bone from the out of doors, um, out out of its box, and now okay. we're just lightly cleaning off the surface so that we can take our bone sample without too much of the um, dirt left on it. Precisely. So I'm trying to remove this, but without really scraping into the surface of the bone, because obviously we don't want to disrupt that, because that is what we want to test. We then ran our final samples on the PXRF and EGM. Here are our results. Here are the PXRF results for our two controls. We have bone seven, which is a dry control, which just has the base soil plus the bone and no hematite added. Bone eight is the same as bone seven, except with 48 ounces of water added. So we can see with bone seven inside, before and after, before being light pink, after being dark pink, the four week period, that the iron concentration in the bone actually decreased. On the outside of bone seven, the iron concentration increased, but by a very small amount. 
and bone eight, once again, we see actually the iron decreased inside and outside the bone in that four week period. And what this tells us is that the base soil itself doesn't significantly impact the iron concentration in the bone. So this is a really good place to start our project. All right, so we want to let you guys know what some of our results look like. Uh, first of all, we want to show you what the control samples look like. So the bones that we put into the soil, but we did not add any hematite. Um, and so right here, first of all, we'll start with bone seven. Um, this one was in dry soil conditions, no hematite. And while these are tricky little graphs here, essentially what this is telling us is that both the inside and the outside of bone seven before being placed in the soil basically shows no magnetic, no measurable amounts of magnetic minerals. Um, and then after four weeks in the soil, we kind of see the same thing. We start to see a little bit more um, noise in the background, which we've attributed to just the presence of soil um, on the bone now. But we really don't see any type of magnetic um, minerals, which is what we would expect. We didn't add the hematite. So this is good because it tells us that we're getting out what we're putting in. So our other control bone was bone number eight, and the only difference between bone seven and eight was that we added water to the soil. So what we have here on the screen is our AGM results for both the inside and outside of bone eight, the before and four weeks after being in the soil. And again, we see pretty much the same pattern as in we saw in bone seven. Um, there's nothing here yet that is showing us any evidence of magnetic minerals that are measurable above the bone and the soil itself. So here in a moment, we'll get some results where we can see magnetic measurements and you'll see the difference. All right, here are the PXRF results for bone two. Bone two was in dry conditions with 30 grams or 3% of hematite added to it. Here we have the inside of the bone and the outside of the bone and the before four weeks and the after four weeks. So we can see clearly that the iron content increased in that four week period, both inside and outside the bone. Now let's compare that to our AGM results. So for the AGM with bone two, we see that before this four week period, there are really no measurable trace amounts of hematite. However, after the four weeks, we actually see a hysteresis loop forming for both of them. And this means that the AGM is indeed picking up hematite in both of these samples and that leaching has occurred. So for bone number three, uh, we're going to show you some interesting results. So these PXRF data show us that when we took the initial samples from bone number three, there was just a little bit of iron present. But after placing bone number three into the soil, which contained 5% or 50 grams of hematite, four weeks later, we see a major increase in the content of iron for both the inside and the outside of bone three. Uh, so let's see how that uh, measures up to the AGM results for bone three. All right, so uh, for bone three on the AGM, you can see that um, the before for the inside and the outside of the bone shows no measurable amount of magnetic minerals present. So this is what we would expect. What's unexpected is that on the outside of bone three after four weeks, there are still no measurable magnetic materials detected. And that's not what we would expect given that we added 5% hematite to the soil. However, for the inside of bone three, uh, after four weeks, we do see this perfect hysteresis loop, which tells us that magnetic minerals were detected. So we have this interesting contrast, both between the outside and the inside, but also, but also between our AGM results and our PXRF results, uh, because we, we see such a clear jump in the iron content for both the inside and the outside of this bone that we would have almost certainly predicted that the AGM would have caught that magnetic mineral presence uh, and that we would have hysteresis loops at four weeks for both the outside and the inside. But we don't, we just have it for one, uh, one of those two samples. So that in itself is interesting conclusion. Turning then to bone six, this is the same as bone three in that 50 grams of hematite were added to the soil, but this one additionally sat in 48 ounces of water. 
And the results from bone six are interesting because we see on the inside there's actually a decrease in the iron concentration detected in the bone. But for the outside, there was an increase. And so this is interesting in comparison because we would have expected to see, as with bone three, an increase in both of these categories. And the fact that we didn't could be significant towards our final conclusions. Turning then to the AGM for bone six. And for bone number six, again, this one we had the 5% hematite and this was, there was, bone was submerged in 48 ounces of water. Uh, so the, at the beginning of the experiment, our before samples, there are no measurable amounts of magnetic minerals in the bone. And then after four weeks, again, we don't actually see these clear hysteresis loops that we would be looking for to see that magnetic measurement. We do see this S shape start to begin, and we see a lot of noise here, um, but we do not see the clear hysteresis loop, which is surprising as this 5% of hematite is on the higher end of what we've added. In conclusion, we can see the leaching of magnetic materials into some of the bones in as little as four weeks. But there were surprises, such as with bone three, where we added 5% hematite, but did not get a hysteresis loop after four weeks. This speaks to the variability not only between bones, but also within individual bones. With respect to the larger project underway, which centers around investigations of hemozoan, a biomarker for malaria, the results of this experimental project have shown us that hematite and other iron oxides that occur naturally in soils can leach into bones once they are buried, and this is sure to be important in interpreting any, da any data we gather from archaeological bone samples especially if we're looking for evidence of a highly magnetic biomarker such as hemozone.